Good morning and welcome to Doylestown Presbyterian Church. Let us prepare our hearts this morning to worship God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin, taken from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3 and 4b through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your inequity, who heals all your diseases. Steadfast love, mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live. Is renewed like the eagle.
Please be seated. We come before God not as despised sinners, but as beloved children of God. With the confidence of children of God, let us humbly confess our sins together. Gracious God, you bless us with all we need, yet time and time again we can hold back in our giving. We fear there will not be enough. We can withhold our time. We can withhold our money, saying, who knows what will happen. Your mercies never cease. Forgive our fears and refusals. Help us to be like the poor widow, giving all because we trust you. Help our gratitude be a witness to your grace. We make these confessions asking, Lord, have mercy. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. God is doing a new thing, and now it springs forth. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please turn and share that with one another. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 12, verses 44 through 47, and can be found in your pew Bibles in the Old Testament, page 442. Please listen for God's word to you. On that day, men were appointed over the chambers for the stores, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites from the fields belonging to the towns. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For in the days of David and Aspha, long ago, there was a leader of the singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the days of Zer Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers. They set aside that which was for the Levites, and the Levites set, asart, set aside apart that which was for the descendants of Aaron. The word of the Lord.
would invite the children to come and join me for our time together this morning. Good morning. I want to show you something, see if you can tell me what this is. Do you have any idea what this is? Can you tell what that is? Addie, what do you think that is? Well, it looks like it could be a rock. Any other guesses? Uh, uh, yes, exactly. It is a piece of money from a different place. It fr is from a long, long time ago. In fact, we think this piece of money is about 2,000 years old. So it's a very old piece of money. I want you to keep that in mind as I share with you a moment from the Bible when, when Jesus is talking. And Jesus is in a place called the temple. Do you know what the temple was? You know what the Okay, sometimes, yeah, a, a temple can look like a museum. This particular one is where people would come to worship. It would be like a church. Uh, but it's, in Jesus' time, it, it wouldn't have been a church. It was a temple where people came together and to sing their praise and to thank God. So here's a story about something that happened when Jesus was at the temple. He said, the temple was big and beautiful. Many people came there to worship God. Inside the temple were some big money boxes. They were open at the top so that people could put money in them. You see the boxes there, and it looks like all kinds of gold coins that people have put in there. The, the money was for the temple and all that was used in the worship of God. One day, Jesus sat down across from the money boxes, and he saw many rich people put in lots of money. Then one poor woman walked up to the boxes. She put in two small coins, and it was like this. This would be a coin like what she put in. See how small it is? And we said, told that she put in two of those. Jesus looked at his friends and he said, this poor woman put in more than the rich people did. Here's why. He said, the rich people still have much money left, but this woman only had two coins. She did not have any more money. The rich people only gave part of what they had. She gave all of what she had. Now, why do you think Jesus was excited about what she had done? Why do you think Jesus was excited about that? Because uh, they want money. Because, because the money helps, absolutely, helps, helps um, the worship of God? Yeah, Andrew. Okay, so... Okay, right. So, so people who are would be poor, like this woman was, might be scared about putting the money in because... She gave everything. That's right. Absolutely. And Jesus was, was praising her. He, she was say, he was saying how wonderful it is that she has done this. And you know, when, when we're here in church, each week we have a time when, when the plates get offered, uh, sent down the pews, and it comes back up here, and that's a way where our folks are able to give. And they don't give coins like this, but they give things that are very valuable to help us as a church do all the things that we do. And so we thank God for that kind of of giving today, even as we remember one long ago who gave everything as a way of saying thank you to God. So let's pray together, and if you'd repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the widow of long ago. Help us to give like her. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming out.
Our New Testament lesson can be found in the Gospel of Luke. It is on page 85 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bible. And it recounts the moment that I just shared with the children of a day when Jesus and his disciples were in the temple and as they sat there watching what people brought in terms of their gifts to God. We begin with the first verse of that 21st chapter. Jesus looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. He said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Let us pray. We give thanks, O oh God, for this moment when we can be still in your presence. We pray that you will send us your Holy Spirit, that you will quiet all other voices but your own, opening us to hear what you would have us know and do. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In seven days, our congregation will gather to offer our commitments for a generos generosity initiative that we are calling Embark. As part of both worship services next week, we will be inviting our members to come forward and in a sealed envelope to place their best estimate of giving for the next two years on the communion table. It is always a wonderful moment in our life as a body of faith as we see all ages come down the aisles and share their gifts with God and encourage you to come be part of that time with us. To help us get ready for that moment, we have been focusing here in worship on times when ancestors in the faith also embarked, set out on a particular journey. And so we began with that moment when Jesus set out toward Jerusalem. Despite knowing what awaited him in the city where he would die, he set forth because of his trust in God. Last week, we read of the moment that Abraham left the only home he had ever known and set out for a place that God would show him because of his faith in God. Next Sunday, we will hear of a time when the Apostle Paul set out with hope, forgetting what lies behind, he will say, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Well, today, we focus on one who set out, the only one of the four that we are considering, who at the end of her journey made a financial gift. It's perhaps one of Jesus' best-known teaching occasions. And it came on a day when he and the disciples are in the temple. It's during the last week of his life on earth, and he's watching as individuals are putting gifts into various boxes around the temple. Their actions on that day grew out of the scene that we read in Nehemiah, an Old Testament moment 500 years earlier when the exiles have returned from Babylon and have rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. And on the day that it is dedicated, we are told that they brought their contributions, their first fruits, and their tithes. By the first century, the requirements of how Jews were to respond with their gifts were very clear. And so as Jesus sat around the temple on that day, there were 13 different places where people could give their money. Each one of them had a sign to explain where those particular gifts would go. And we think the shape of it was kind of like this inverse trumpet with an opening at the top for people to then drop their money in it. A couple of those containers were for animals or incense to be burned. One was for the wood to be used for the fire or gold for the altar. There were two of them. They were designated for the required temple tax. A separate one if you were using an old or new shekel to pay that tax. And then there were six that the sign said these were free will offerings. In the words of Embark, they would have been considered a one-fund response. 
in which people would offer their gift and then it be used wherever it was needed. Given the conversation that follows with Jesus, I suspect he was near one of those containers when he started noticing what was happening around him. He turned at one point to his disciples and spoke of all the wealthy people he had seen come and place money in that container. And then he brought to their attention a poor widow who had placed two coins in the container. He says to them, I tell you, she has given more than all that was contributed at the treasury this day. Now, in the King James Version of that scene, her gift is referred to as a mite, an M-I-T-E. That's where we get the term, a widow's mite. It actually formed what was known as a lepton Roman currency, a coin that it took 128 of those to equal a denarius, a one day's wage for a laborer. So if we want to try to understand the nature of her gift, if we think in terms of what is the minimum wage today in Pennsylvania, for someone who worked eight hours, they would earn about $58. And in the case then of the widow, what she contributed was about 45 cents. Jesus said, she has given more than all the others. Given the fact that certainly there were people who must have put more in financially than that amount, he was making a point as he went on to say, for she has given out of her poverty all that she had, whereas they were giving out of their abundance. Over the years, there have been all kinds of ways that people have tried to understand Jesus' instruction in that moment. And there are some who take it at face value, namely of a call from Jesus for people to give all that they have, and somehow suggesting that that is the only gift that is honored by God. I can't imagine that to have been Jesus' meaning on that day. Not only because it raises a standard that would be difficult for many of us, including this pastor, to achieve, but because it somehow would suggest that there's only a certain size of gift that God honors, and I reject that idea out of hand. Others might conclude that what Jesus was talking about here was a a system in the temple in that era in which a poor widow felt compelled to give everything that she had in a sense of being taken advantage of by the system, or that others would view it as a moment that tells us that Jesus notices everything we do. I think either of those interpretations are possible as they fit what we know about Jesus from other places. And yet, when I read it again in terms of thinking about this morning and what we're doing with Embark, I I heard something else and wonder if what Jesus was lifting up in that moment was a difference between the amount of the gift and the cost a difference between what someone gives in terms of an accounting matter of the total versus what one gives in terms of their impact upon themselves. And if, in fact, that is what Jesus meant in this moment, then what I think he is saying is that there's something about the spirit in which that widow gave that he is lifting up, calling upon us to give in that same kind of way. Now, if that is a correct interpretation of his meaning, then it really speaks to something that we teach regularly at the church, namely proportionate giving. This understanding that God has blessed all of us, but we have not all been blessed equally in a financial sense. And thus, we have an opportunity to express our gratitude to God by considering what percentage of our income we'll give back to God through the church. That when we act in that kind of way, we are displaying equal generosity as others, even if the amount is not the same. And I think Jesus' words on that scene would lift up and encourage that kind of response still. And yet the widow in that moment did more than proportionate giving. Jesus tells us she gave everything she had to live on. And it'd be nice if we knew more about her. If we knew how recently she had lost her husband or if she was living with some of her adult children and thus could take this step 
if she lived in Jerusalem or had taken this journey to be there for Passover, we are not told. All we know is that she was poor and that she gave all that she had to live on, which suggests that what Jesus is pointing to is a kind of giving marked by the spirit in which she gave, namely a spirit of abandon. On Friday night, about 60 of our members gathered together for a time that we called an advanced commitment event in this Embark initiative. Despite the power outages that were going on all around us on that night, we came together for a time of worship and fellowship, a time of singing and prayer. At the conclusion of that time, those who felt ready to offer their commitment for Embark came forward. And in a few minutes, you will get an opportunity to hear from Linda and Phil Cocosa about the results of that time. I'm not going to steal their thunder, but I do want to tell you that when you look at what happened on that night as an act of encouragement to the rest of you, what was really clear to me is that on a collective basis, some of our fellow members are giving with abandon. That, that pattern will need to continue. The goal that our session has set for this initiative is a very bold one that if in fact achieved will mean that we have all the resources we need for the next two years for every form of ministry and we'll also retire the renovation loan that remains on our project. That goal in and of itself, if reached, would be a remarkable statement of faith for it would represent the highest giving in our church's history you know, over a two-year basis. And it would come on the heels of Flourish, which when it concludes it in December will have already been the highest in our long history. It is a, a time, though, I think, for us to recognize and for me to acknowledge that it is a big ask and that there's been a decade or more of generosity by our congregation. And the only way we will reach that is if once again, we go even beyond what happened in Flourish and give, to give with abandon. Several weeks ago, I received the kind of letter no one likes to get. I had gone to my mailbox, and as I was walking back to the house, sorting through all the grocery store ads and, and the little postcards of people seeking my vote on Tuesday, I found this envelope addressed to Lori and me. The return address said, Pennsylvania Department of Revenue, Office of Individual Taxes. So when I opened it up, I saw this statement that said that in 2017, we had underpaid our taxes. More specifically, it said that I had underreported our income by half and thus had to pay not only what I should have paid two years before, but a penalty and interest ever since, resulting in a huge figure. Well, I knew it was a mistake. Lori and I both have state taxes withheld from every paycheck, and in, in a typical year, we might owe a couple hundred more when it's time for filing. So I went down and I pulled out a copy of our return, which I had done and had completed by hand. I compared the statement to what we had submitted at the time, and it matched up line for line. And then I got to the bottom of this document that the state had sent us, and realized that the computer had doubled our taxable income. So I, I knew I had found what the problem was, and a couple of days later, got on the phone with a very helpful representative from Harrisburg. As we were talking it through, I, I explained the situation. I said, I don't, I don't understand how the computer made this kind of mistake. And she said, well, there's something I want to explore. Can I put you on hold for a minute? And while she did, I continued to look over the document and, and I, I found what the mistake had been. And I, I want to show it to you. I don't want to show you my return, but here, let me show you. First, uh, here's a, a form that's probably familiar to all of you. 
of what we submit uh, to, to the state each year, and this is the 2017 reform. And like all of you, what I'd done is I had listed all of my income, the various sources, and then got to the bottom. Let me show you a larger version of that. So you see on the tax return that line nine is where you're supposed to put your totalable, total P Pennsylvania taxable income. Well, by mistake, I put mine on line eight, which reads gambling and lottery winnings. <laughs> And so, the computer thought Lori and I had had an incredible run with Lady Luck in 2017. <laughs> and so, the computer had automatically doubled our income for the year and calculated what we owed based on that. Well, the woman on the phone was very helpful. She told me the forms I needed to complete, and I got those back, and a couple weeks later, everything had been settled. You need to know that next Sunday, we're not looking for you to make a commitment that will require you to have gambling winnings. <laughs> we're not looking for you to commit a number that represents all that you have either. And yet what we are inviting you to do is to prayerfully give in the same spirit as did that poor widow of long ago. And to respond in a way that represents for you an act of faithful abandon. In your case, that might mean completing a commitment card for the first time and allowing it to then shape how you use your resources over the next 24 months. For others of you, that step might represent one in which you move closer to a tithe or beyond it while for others yet, that decision might be one of putting down a number that both excites you and also makes you a little bit anxious. I can't tell you what that number should be for you. And yet what I would invite you to do in the coming weeks is to pray about a way that you could respond that demonstrates what would be an act of generous abandon on your part. And then to join us as a body of faith, committing ourselves once again to continuing in this journey with our Lord and Savior, offering our faithful best as a declaration of our intent to live in the coming years with the kind of abandon demonstrated by a widow. Let us pray. We give thanks, O oh God, for the glimpse that we have of a believer of long ago who put her trust in you. We pray that you will guide us as individuals and as a congregation as we near the moment as a body of faith in which we commit ourselves for the next two years. May it be a gift that represents our devotion to you and one that seeks to journey ahead wherever you take us. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together by reading from the book of Hebrews printed in our bulletin. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Please be seated. If you could please take a moment to pass the act of friendship uh, located along the center aisle, taking note of who is worshiping beside you so you can greet them by name following worship. Just a few announcements of the body. On Monday, uh, lessons and carols tickets will be available. Uh, the tickets are free, but in order to attend that service, uh, you will re need to reserve a ticket. They, last year, they went quite quickly. So if you're considering going to that uh, wonderful event, please uh, reserve your ticket. Uh, there's information about that on page five in the bulletin, how to do that. There'll be a link on the website uh, that you'll be able to complete a form for that. We're also looking to hire two nursery care assistants. There's information about that position um, on page seven in the bulletin, but if you know of somebody or yourself might be a good fit uh, for that position, please uh, consider that. At this time, I'd like to welcome Phil and Linda Kakosa uh, up for an update on Embark. Good morning. Good morning. So Linda and I did some uh, calculations ourselves, and um, we've calculated that this is the uh, 15th time that we've been up in front of the congregation in one form or another speaking to you. So it's kind of habit forming. I'm thinking that every time they start to do the announcements, we're going to get ready to come up here. But um, so if you work back from this morning's talk to the advanced commitment event, that would have been our 13th time talking, and that was on a Friday night. So God, in his uh, ultimate way of uh, having a sense of humor, um, decided that there would be no power in the church for the event. Um, but, it, you know, the church, as, as always, uh, came, you know, stepped up, and Bev and Jeff Fulgham uh, graciously lent us their barn uh, for, for the event. We had, as John said, we had over 60 people there, um, and we uh, uh, overall received so far uh, 68 pledges uh, in that advanced commitment event. When we began planning for this season of giving, our prayer was to engage our community of faith in a conversation about generosity. That conversation led to some amazing action. The dedication and faith of our congregation has been a moving experience for us. The generation began on Friday, as I said, um, and the only way for us to display um, uh, the generosity that we witnessed uh, is to be grateful. Um, we are so grateful for what we saw. The, the energy of the night, the, the spirit that filled each and every one of us was absolutely amazing. So um, what were we grateful for? Of the 68 pledges that we received, um, seven of those pledges are increasing their operating fund giving by at least 50 percent. 27 additional households also increased their giving by at least 10 percent. And five households submitted their pledges for the first time. Now here's a, here's a few stories that came from the evening. Um, in one case, we have a household who multiplied their operating fund giving by 50%, going from $16,000 from the past two years to $24,000 in the next two years for Embark. Another household is increasing their operating fund giving almost 17% by going from $2,400 from the past two years to $2,800 for Embark. 
There is another household increasing their operating fund giving by 37%, going from $54,600 from the past two years to $74,600 in the next two years for Embark. And yet another household is also increasing their operating fund giving by over 81% going from $6,600 from the past two years to $12,000 in the next two years for Embark. These faithful examples have set us on the path toward meeting our goal and by fully funding our ministries. Thank you. We are very, very grateful. Um, and as John has said to us, we, you know, we have a long way to go to meet this, uh, this challenge that was put forth by us from the session. And next Sunday, we all have the opportunity to decide individually and collectively as a household what role we are going to play in that story as we bring up our Pledges for Commitment Sunday. I hope by now you have already received one of these in the mail. If not, they are available on the bridge and also in the church office. You can also make your contribution if you're not able to be with us next Sunday. You can make it online. It is still completely private information. And um, we also can drop it off during the week at church if you, uh, if you choose to, if you're not able to join us. But um, it is a very special day, and we look forward to seeing you there as we um, write the next story for our church together. Thank you. Thank you, Phil and Linda. That's an exciting update. They've also been moving around in the sanctuary where they seat, sit. It's thrown me off on those 13 times I've had to call them forward. Typically, they're over there. Um, so at this time, the pastors are not aware of any members in Doylestown Hospital. Uh, the Rosebud this morning celebrates the birth of Samuel Adam Chauvin, uh, son of Alexandra and Adam. Proud DPC grandparents, Jim and Linda Rotowski, and great uh, grandparents, Mary and Dennis Turpening. Uh, the sympathy of the congregation is extended to two families, uh, to Catherine Bentram and family on the death of her grandfather, Justin uh, Clarence Haggerty, who died at the age of 106. Uh, the sympathy of the congregation is also extended to uh, Vicki Gill, uh, my wife, on uh, the death of her grandmother, uh, Maria Roberts. Uh, she passed away on Halloween. Uh, we would ask you this morning to utilize the prayer cards in your pew. Um, as part of our prayer this morning, we'll be remembering the saints of the church that have passed away in the last 12 months. You'll see a list in your bulletin of all those members. Let us go to God in prayer. Loving God, we come to you asking you to hear our prayers, to ease our burdens, and help us to live good and holy lives. Help us to be beacons of light in this world. Help us to be instruments of peace, to work towards justice and inclusion, to preach and share and demonstrate the gospel to the ends of the earth. God, we pray for those in our nation who are in positions of trust and power. May they serve the cost, cause of justice, promote dignity for all people, and freedom and peace. We pray for our families, our friends, our neighbors. Help them to live in joy, peace, and health. Help us as a community to be a beacon as we share in the work and the ministry you have called DPC to. We give special thanks to you for the birth of Samuel. We celebrate this new life. Every life you give, O oh God, is precious. And we thank you for him this day. We pray for all those who are sick and in need of healing. For all those who come to mind silently. We pray for those who are grieving. We think of the family and friends of Judson and Maria. May those who grieve, grieve with hope. With fondness, fondness and gratitude, O oh God, we remember those who have entered the church triumphant in the last 12 months. 
We think of William Sweezy, George Armstrong, Lyda Coulter, Jennifer Kerr Bauman, George Mill, William Grun, Ruth Hunsinger, Ruth L. Toner, Caroline Whiteneck, Frank LaRosa, Irma Martin, Clifford Mill, Henry Strong, Edgar Neff, Mary McDowell, Lois Thatcher, Janet Sudgeon. We thank you, O oh God, that we have been strengthened by their witness and their work in the church. Help us to live and love until we join them in life eternal. With that hope in mind, we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In Matthew, it says, freely you have received, freely give. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth.
These gifts are given from our abundance, and we rejoice in the thought of helping this church fulfill the holy mission and charge of Jesus Christ. Let us prayerfully consider how our gifts are used and find a way to go forward with gifts given even more sacrificially, knowing that our Lord and Savior will bless our giving and always provides for all his children who give to others from their hearts. Amen. Go out to this day, enjoy, celebrating those who have gone before us, whose example continues to shape and inspire us, trusting that God will go with us in all that this day and week will hold. So as we depart, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and sustain you on this day and forevermore. Amen.